Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the important topics that Kant is going to explain to us in the preface to his short work, The Prolegomena to Any Future Metaphysics, is the relationship between that work and his earlier and much longer work, The Critique of Pure Reason. Is this supposed to be an introduction to the critique? We're actually going to see no, that's not quite the case. And the place that we want to pick up is where he's talking about David Hume and what Kant did with Hume's problem or objection or uh, issue that he was bringing up. But we've already talked about that a bit. So we'll pick up with him saying, I tried first whether Hume's objection could not be put into what's translated as a general form, but all in mind, right? So whether it could be done in a universal way, more than just a mere generality. And he said, I, I soon found that the concept of the connection of cause and effect was by means, no means, the only concept by which the understanding thinks the connection of things a priori, how things that we are cognizing, experiencing, how are these things connected together? And can we abstract this away from experience? And the answer is yes, not only with cause and effect, but with a whole bunch of other matters as well. And so uh, Kant says, I sought to ascertain their number. When I had done this, starting from a single principle, I proceeded to the deduction of these concepts, right? Concepts are uh, begriffen and deduction is just a cognate there. This is a, a procedure that he's uh, working through. And then he says, I was now certain these were not derived from experience, but they rather sprang from the pure understanding. And he says, you know, Hume never really thought about doing this. It seemed impossible and it didn't occur to anyone else. But this is, you know, a possible thing to do. It was the most difficult task ever undertaken in the service of metaphysics. And uh, he says, I couldn't use metaphysics to do this, but I succeeded in solving Hume's problem, not merely in a particular case, but with respect to the whole, the entire faculty of pure reason, das ganze Vermögen der reinen Vernunft. So the entirety of this higher faculty, higher than the understanding, that is reason. And so he says, you know, once I did this, I could actually determine the entire sphere of pure reason completely and from universal principles in, this is very important, its boundaries, its grenzen, right? and in its content, its inhalt. And he's going to use that term grenzen a little bit later. Kant is very much about limits and setting boundaries to how far we can go with things. That's part of what critical philosophy is about. And this is what we indeed find in the critique of pure reason. So he's starting from a particular you know, but not completely uh, particular, not single uh, I issue that Hume is, is raising, one of, of significant scope. And then he's going even further. He's, he's taking a more radical approach to it. And that's what we get in the Critique of Pure Reason, which is quite a massive tome. Now, Kant is going to point something out at this point that's a little bit humorous in some respects. 
how did people receive the critique of pure reason? It says, I fear that the working out of Hume's problem in its widest extent, that is in this book, the critique of pure reason, it will fare as the problem itself fared when first proposed. Who first proposed it? Hume. And people didn't understand what Hume was really getting at, and they came up with solutions that weren't real solutions to this problem. And so the critique of pure reason is going to be misjudged. Unrichtig beurteilen. So urteilen is uh, judgment, right? Beurteilen uh, is, is another way of saying that. And unrichtig, wrongly, right? Unrightly. So it's going to be misjudged. Why will it be misjudged? Because it's going to be misunderstood. And why is it going to be misunderstood? Well, Kant does not have a very high opinion of many of his fellow scholars. Misunderstood because men choose to skim through the book and not to think through it. A disagreeable task because the work is in fact dry, obscure, opposed to all ordinary notions and moreover long-winded. So he's engaging in a little bit of self-criticism there, but he's also saying eh, these, these readers are lazy too. So they're not going to understand what's going on in the critique of pure reason. And, you know, we do see, in fact, criticisms of uh, other people of his time saying, yeah, this book isn't really that, that great. And then he brings up two complaints that could be made about the critique of pure reason. One set he thinks are pretty groundless. So somebody might come along and say, you know, the critique of pure reason is, um, you know, philosophers are going to complain that it lacks popularity, and that's actually just a cognate for popularitat, um, entertainment, unterhaltung, you know, enjoyableness. People don't read the, the critique of pure reason uh, like they do a novel because of the wonderful characters or anything like that. And also facility, or we could say ease, uh, gemächlichkeit, the, you know, comfortableness of it. It's a difficult work. It's a great philosophical text. So, you know, do you really expect it to be put into a popular way? And he says, I didn't expect to hear complaints from philosophers when the existence of a highly praised and indispensable cognition and their kentness, a knowledge, is at stake, which can't be established other than by the strictest rules of scholarly precision. So if you're going to complain that the book isn't an easy book to read, your complaint is off base because there's no way you could do the work in the Critique of Pure Reason and make it a fun book to, to go along with, right? That's the wrong kind of complaint. Now, Kant will also say that there is a certain obscurity, a dunkelheit, ein gewissig dunkelheit, right, to this, this book. So he's conceding that. And why is this? Well, because of the diffuseness, the weitläufigkeit of its plan. Diffuseness, maybe not the best word there in this particular English translation, weitläufigkeit. So ranging over a you know, very wide scope of matters. Matters, by the way, that are all connected with each other, as he's going to say a little bit later. He'll tell us that pure reason is a sphere so separate and self-contained we cannot touch a part without affecting all the rest. So, you know, we have to do a big, big, thick book to outline all of this stuff. And he says, okay, that's a legitimate criticism, this obscurity, this difficulty involved in it. This book, The Prolegomena, can help out with that. And he says that's the, the goal of it. Um, as regards this obscurity, uh, owing to which the principal points of the investigation are easily lost sight of, this complaint is just, and I intend to remove it by the present prolegomena, the read this ahead of time, right? And then he's going to help specify what the relationship is between these. And he tells it that, that it is, in fact, a preliminary, uh, a for Übigen, 
to the critique which is uh, a foundation, right? So he says, the first mentioned work, the, the critique, which discusses the pure faculty of reason and its whole extent and bounds, will remain the foundation, the Grundlage, to which the prolegomena as a preliminary exercise refer, that critique must exist as a science, systematic and complete as to its smallest parts, before we can think of letting metaphysics on the scene. So we don't just clear the prolegomena, we actually have to go through the first critique, and then we can do metaphysics after that. And interestingly, just as a side note, Kant is going to talk about metaphysics in his work. He's not banishing it forever. There's even within the practical philosophy a metaphysics of morals, right? Which is a very important part of his work. And he's going to say that he thinks that he can um, persuade the reader that the prolegomena, the prolegomena will uh, persuade the reader, that this critique, this critical philosophy, which is leading into metaphysics, uh, is a perfectly new science of which no one has uh, even thought. And, um, you know, Hume himself didn't, didn't recognize this. He talks about Hume uh, foundering on the, the shoals of skepticism. But the critique is actually setting out for us the possibilities of a new science, and the prolegomena can persuade, it can lead somebody to that. Now, although he calls it a preliminary to the critique, um, the translation can be a little bit confusing because uh, it's, it's turning verbs into nouns. And Kant wants to say that the prolegomena is not a sketch for the, uh, here we go, although a mere sketch preceding the critique of pure reason, that's not what the prolegomena is. Why not? Because it would be unintelligible, unreliable, and useless. But the prolegomena is, he says, more useful as a sequel. It, it, folk, it follows on the critique of pure reason. So it doesn't precede it for her gay and go out in advance of it. So you read this first and then read the critique. Rather, they're doing complementary things. And you might actually read this afterwards, as indeed many of his contemporary readers would be doing, who have already read the first critique. Now, interestingly, again, as a side note, very often when we are teaching Kant, um, the speculative or, or you know, pure philosophy, we will in fact have students, undergraduate students, read the prolegomena first and then go on to the first critique. Kant is actually telling us maybe that's not the best way to, to do things. Now, the last thing that we need to bring up is a contrast that he also tells us, and this is very near the end of the preface. He says that that work being completed, I offer here such a plan, which is sketched out after an analytical method. Okay, so we've got this term analytic, which plays an important role in what's going to come afterwards. He's not using it in exactly <clears throat> the same sense. This is referring to the mode of presentation, as we see when he tells us that the critique of pure reason had to be executed in the synthetical style. Now, the synthetical style, the style there is lea art, the way of teaching, the mode of presentation. So we've got a difference between what we've got here in this text and in the much larger critique. And what he says is that executed in the synthetic style in order that the science may present all its articulations as the structure of a peculiar cognitive faculty in their natural combination. So in a way, you can say that the synthetic style is closer to the matters that, that Kant is investigating and then presenting to us 
in the critique of pure reason. Whereas the analytic style, you're coming to it afterwards and you're saying, can I present this in a, a, an easier to digest manner? And that's what the prolegomena is intended to do for all of us readers. So that is the relationship between these two very important texts uh, that are part of the speculative critical philosophy. Um, now we have a clear idea where Kant is going with this and the purpose of the prolegomena as a work of philosophy.